in just six short verses. Psalm 1 gives us a couple different pictures of a life of faith. That first, there's this picture of a beautiful tree. And when I read Psalm 1, I think about this particular tree that I saw every year as a child going to the beach with my family. It's this massive tree where you always see a child climbing up in it. The trunk is so big, you can't get your arms around it. And there are these sprawling branches. Each branch is as big as the trunk of another tree. And they're low to the ground, which makes them accessible and perfect for climbing. And there's this gorgeous, iconic rope swing hanging from one of them that you could spend hours playing on this tree. And in the psalm, next to this tree is a flowing stream of water, that beautiful, peaceful sound echoing in the background. And the tree produces good fruit. It's a scene that almost invites us to a place where we could sit underneath that tree for hours on end, just resting and basking in the abiding presence of God. The second picture, though, is slightly different. It's a picture that seems to be more in black and white. There's no color to it or nuance or texture. It's simply a fork in the road, a forced decision that down this road, That's the way of the righteous. Down that road, you are happy. If you choose the other direction, that's the way of the wicked. That road leads to ruin. It is, as the psalmist says, the path that sinners tread. And the psalmist says, you have to choose which is a very different feeling than just resting and basking under that beautiful tree. But it's still helpful, inviting us to carefully weigh our decisions and to choose what is most good. But unfortunately, the longer we live in this life, we discover that rarely are our hardest decisions as simple as two distinct choices. It's like following what sounded like good advice at the time, only to discover later that we traded in what was sacred for something of very little value. Or it's like realizing that that image of success that we carried around for years turned out to feel more like failure when we gained further perspective. Or it is like listening to trusted voices only to discover that they were right about some things, but wrong about other things that when we face those hardest decisions, all we want to do is go find that tree and just sit under it and rest in God's presence. And then it gets even more complicated when you sit down and listen to the words of Jesus. Because Jesus says out loud what we all feared about a life of faith, that it is a serious commitment. Where he says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me 
cannot be my disciple? Those words are so steep. All we want to do is sit underneath that beautiful tree. (laughs) That those words are just too demanding that I would settle for a fork in the road. But before we run away from them, we have to remember their hyperbole. That there's a little exaggeration added to them because Jesus is trying to make a point that we should not diminish them or disregard them. We need to take them seriously. But Jesus is not asking us to hate our loved ones. That we are invited into a serious commitment to the steadfast love of God, a commitment that shapes every other commitment in our lives. It's the same commitment we see in the life of Jesus and on the cross which can clarify some of our hardest decisions. As Jesus says, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Again, a little hyperbole. But it reminds us we should never hold on to anything so tightly that it ends up defining us in ways that are no longer life-giving. In his book, The Art of the Commonplace, Wendell Berry talks about attending a college graduation at a major university where everyone is wearing those funny graduation hats, where you have to constantly swoop that tassel out from in front of your face, and they're wearing those distinguished academic robes. But then, in addition to those, the graduates from the business school were wearing for sale signs around their neck walking across the stage and marketing themselves because they needed a job after graduation. And it was meant in jest. But it also exposes a mindset. Is everything truly for sale, that Jesus could have profited, as Judas did, if he had simply held back, if he had not criticized Rome, who controlled Israel at the time, if he had just refrained from criticizing the religious leaders, if he had just not listened to his conscience, or ignored his empathy for others. But Jesus' commitment was elsewhere. Jesus was committed to grace. And there are times in our lives where we can sit down under that beautiful tree and just rest in the presence of God. But then there are times where we will face a fork in the road, a decision that is harder than we anticipated it to be. But then grace also calls us towards a serious commitment to God and to others. That it is as Diedrich Bonhoeffer describes and lived where he said, cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. Which sounds rather serious. 
that grace is and always a gift of love. That we receive it because we are loved. That we do not earn it. But that does not mean it will not cost us something. So we might hold back. But it is, as W.H. Alden writes, we would rather be ruined than change. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. And friends, I do not have to tell you how hard it is to let our illusions die. The way we've always seen things, the way we've always done things, the way we've always made sense of things. But when we do, when we let our illusions die, it feels like we are giving up all of our possessions, our entire world only to discover a new world that looks a little bit more like the humility, hope, and faithfulness of Jesus. One practical way that we let our illusions die is by going the second mile. As Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go a mile, go also the second mile. That we do not leave our illusions behind simply by basking in God's presence under that tree. And we do not even leave them behind when we have to make one of those hard decisions at the fork in the road. It is only when we go the second mile that we are able to leave our illusions behind and open ourselves up to something brand new. Where we discover the tender mercy of grace, or where we witness the grit and endurance of love, or where we experience the joy of commitment. That it is truly amazing what we discover on the second mile. Just ask the first grade Sunday school teacher who fell in love with her students and decided that from then on out, at the beginning of the year, every year she was going to sit down and write a handwritten note to each and every one of them until they graduated high school. And now there are shoeboxes full of notes. Or just ask the high school senior who took the time to meet the freshman in high school in the youth group for coffee because the freshman was scared to death of high school. And this senior simply listened and offered gentle encouragement. And then he checked in with the freshman throughout the year And the freshman still hasn't forgotten some 25 years later. Or just ask the neighbor who wandered over one Saturday afternoon and started cutting the grass of the elderly couple just across the street because of that awful steep hill in their front yard. 
And it ended up opening the door to a friendship across the generations, which changed both of them in the very best ways. That it is truly amazing what we discover on the second mile. That with all of that hyperbole and exaggeration, Jesus invites us to ask the question, where in our lives are we pursuing comfort? Where what is called for is a little discomfort because the second mile is not always comfortable but it is always full of grace and there is no exaggeration in that amen